Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. Welcome to my kitchen. I'm really happy to have you here with me today. We are going to be doing some canning together. We are going to can a whole bunch of squash. I have some left to chop here, but as you can see back there, we have two big bowls of chopped squash, so we are going to can them. And if I have any extra, I will probably bake it in the oven and make a puree. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. We are also going to can a bunch of cowboy candy and the jalapenos are all nice and chopped up here and ready to go. I also want to make a beef stew for dinner tonight, so I have some stew beef that is thawing and we are going to do that together as well. It is an absolutely beautiful day. I don't know if you can see out the window back there, but it is just gorgeous. So I'm hoping to get all my kitchen work done this morning so that I can go out and spend some time in the garden this afternoon. I still have a little bit of garden work left to do this year. We need to get the um, garlic all planted. I shared with you all the garlic that I bought, so I'll do that with you a little bit later on this week. Uh, someone sent me some walking onion bulbs, which I'm really excited about. I've been wanting to grow Egyptian walking onions for a long time, so we're going to get those planted as well, but I can hardly wait to get outside and get some of my hands in the dirt because those days are definitely numbered. Our ground is going to be freezing here very, very soon. So let's talk canning squash. The way that I am canning my squash, as you can see here, is I am chopping it up into around one inch cubes. And I am going to be blanching my squash for a couple of minutes. You can cold pack your squash, that means not to blanch it. But for, from, <clears throat> excuse me, from all the research I have done, um, you have a more consistent product if you do blanch it first and it tends to be a little bit less waterlogged, like the cubes themselves become less waterlogged if you blanch them first. So I obviously prefer to have less waterlogged cubes, so that is the way that I am going to do it, but if you wanna do it the um, cold pack method, you can do that as well. And it's not recommended to can puree because they, during the testing process and all the places that test these kinds of things, they have found that there is an uneven heat distribution when the squash is pureed because it's so dense. So you can absolutely do pureed squash. It's just best to freeze it rather than to can it. I have also thought about maybe doing some in the freeze dryer um, and giving that a try as well. So we'll see how many jars we end up today. I was kind of hoping for 14 quarts and then to use the rest to make puree. And I am going to freeze dry some of it. I haven't tried freeze drying pureed squash. So I'm gonna try freeze drying it and then the rest will go into the freezer. So we're just about to the point where we have everything all chopped here. So this is called Maddie's Squash Scooper. And apparently it was purchased from a, um, an Amish store and it was sent to me by one of you. Thank you so much because this is absolutely the best little kitchen gadget for this time of year ever. It scoops the seeds out so perfectly. So you can see it has a little bit of an edge here and it's not super sharp, but sharp enough to do a really good job of scraping the seeds out perfectly. I love it so much. That made very short work of actually gutting all of the seeds out. And then we just used a peeler and a knife, depending on the preference of the person that was peeling, to get everything peeled off. It's much easier if you um, cut your squash into pieces like this for peeling um, than it is to try to do it when the pieces are really large. This is my Cinderella pumpkins that we're doing today. So this is four nice sized pumpkins. Oops, dropped a piece on the floor. So there we go. Now we have all of our pumpkin ready. Just looks so beautiful. It's practically glowing over there. It's so orange and gorgeous. So the reason that I am choosing to blanch these is because when I was doing some research on it, in um, a couple of people saying that it does help to make them less waterlogged when they go into the jars. So we'll try it and see because I did do them cold packed the last time I did them and I did find them to be quite waterlogged and didn't have a ton of flavor and I actually made the decision that I wasn't going to can a bunch again. But because this method of blanching is supposed to help with that problem, I thought I would give it another go. So all I'm gonna do with these once they, um, when it comes to actually using them, so the way that I'll be using this canned squash 
is when I take it out of the jar, I'll puree it at that point and I'll use it in pumpkin French toast, which is one of my kids' favorite, whoops, favorite uh, pumpkin recipes, pumpkin muffins, pumpkin cake, all that kind of stuff. You could also make a really quick squash soup with this, adding a little coconut milk, some curry, some canned potatoes. We do, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> love squash soup. Once we have these filled, we're gonna top them off with boiling water. And I think I'm actually going to use this water because this water has flavor in it from the squash itself. So unlike with potatoes, you usually don't wanna reuse or use the water that you boiled your potatoes in if you're blanching your potatoes for canning because one of the things that you want to remove is the extra starch, but these aren't a super starchy vegetable. So I'm gonna use this liquid So beautiful. I hope they don't lose too much color when I can them because these are just gorgeous. Sunshine in a jar. Hello. 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 Hi. Is that squash? Yeah, pumpkin. Wow. Isn't it gorgeous? You mean pretty? Yeah, yeah like isn't it beautiful? It looks like sunshine. Okay, so that was my mother-in-law, by the way. She is here for the morning and a little bit of the afternoon. Um, so you do want to debubble your jars, especially if you are canning something that is has some chunks in it like this, because a lot of air can get trapped down in there. All right. And then that was my son, my eldest son walking past as well. Okay, so now we're gonna do our lids. Okay, so now we are going to ring these up and get them into our pressure canner. So I'm gonna run both of my pressure canners so that we can get as many done at once as possible. My mother-in-law and I are going to be doing some organization upstairs in our loft because I've told you that we're doing a lot of renovations right now and we just had the upstairs painted. So we need to go and now clean it all and organize it all. So while our canning's happening, I will be doing that. Okay, we're gonna move this off the stove here. I want to get these into the jars right away before they get mushy. Canner one and canner two. So we add two inches of water into the bottom of our canner. And into our second canner. Okay, let's jar up the rest of these. I love the colors of autumn. Isn't that a beautiful autumn color? So lovely. These Cinderella pumpkins are a nice pumpkin because they are sweet and the flesh is fairly dense. So they do, <coughs> excuse me, can and make pies well. They're a much larger pumpkin than your average sugar pumpkin. And, uh, but the plants themselves take up pretty much the same amount of space as a sugar pumpkin does. So I have taken to growing these for pies and um, purees. You know what I might also make is a little bit of pumpkin butter. That sounds absolutely delicious. So what I might do is get a roaster oven out and throw a bunch of these into a roaster oven and cook them down and make pu pumpkin butter. Okay, we are going to get these into the canner. The National Center for Home Preserving is the best site that I have found for canning times. Because if you go online and you look up canning times for squash, you are going to find 
lots of different uh, recommendations. So, so they say that for quartz, processing time is 90 minutes for quartz and at 2000 feet or below, it is 11 pounds of pressure. And then it goes up for us, it's 12 pounds of pressure and so on. So on my pressure canner, I have a weighted gauge pressure canner that has five, 10 and 15. So I always just bump it up to 15. So we'll let these run through the canner. So I have decided that while this canning's happening, I'm gonna fill this up with a bunch of pumpkin and so that we can have this to make a pumpkin butter with. I'm really excited about this because I think this is gonna be delicious. So good. And plus we have all of this nice chopped pumpkin over here. We're gonna put a ton of them into here. I can think of a ton of uses for this. My plan here is I'm going to cook those down until they're nice and soft. Then we will use my immersion blender and puree them up and then add all of the flavorings to it at that point and then we'll cook it down again a little bit more. All right, friends, we are done canning the um, squash over there. And we also have our pumpkin. Is that gonna be too hot? Nope. <laughs> our pumpkin here that we are going to mash up into plain pumpkin puree. And then all the pumpkin that was over in my roaster oven is ready to add all the sugar and the seasonings that we're going to add to it to make the pumpkin butter. So in the same way that I explained that it's not safe to can pumpkin puree, obviously pumpkin butter is basically just sweetened pumpkin puree. So we'll be freezing that. And I need to make our beef stew. We are going to make the beef stew out of my cookbook here. And we are going to start with two pounds of ground beef and we're gonna brown this up really, really well in a big pot. A Dutch oven is the perfect thing to use for this, but I'm gonna be making a larger batch of stew today and my Dutch oven is not big enough. So <clears throat> we are going to, thank you, use a big pot instead. Turn that up to high. Add some avocado oil to that. Lard works really well, but I currently do not have, actually, just wait a minute. I think I did make lard actually just a couple months ago. So needless to say, we are going to add some oil to that. And once our oil gets nice and hot, we will throw our beef in and we want that beef to get really, really brown and little dark brown bits on the bottom of our pot because that helps to make the um, gravy a nice brown, nice rich. You don't want it to burn, however, you want it to be just below the point where it's burned. So we are going to start with that. We need onion, potatoes, carrots, turnips. Um, what else can we put in there? Parsnips, which I currently do not have, so I won't be adding parsnips today. To add red pepper, green pepper, celery, all of the delicious things. And it's best to keep your beef in a thin layer. Don't layer it up, otherwise it will steam before it has a chance to get nice and brown. So we have that browning up over there. We're going to add some garlic, three cloves of garlic, some peppers, so I'm gonna get those chopped up right now. I'm getting a late start on supper today. Usually I try to get my supper done in the morning. That's all right. So now, just before I get chopping this stuff up, I'm going to add sugar over there to all of the jalapenos. Let me show you that we have over there in our pot. So I'm going to add a bunch of sugar to this. I will put a recipe down in the show notes for you. So I've already done pickled jalapenos this year 
just straight up pickled with just a little bit of sugar, but these ones are gonna be candied, so it's a lot of sugar. We're going to add some apple cider vinegar, this whole entire thing. And we're going to heat this up until those peppers turn from that nice forest green they are to more of a kind of a French green. I'll show you when they are ready. And then we are going to get those canned up in pint jars. I already have my pint jars all washed and my lids ready to go. So we can just that, let that cook in the background while we get all of the things we need for our stew prepped. if you can see that, but you can see how dark brown all that is. So now we're gonna throw in our onions, our garlic, and our pepper, and some celery. So for our potatoes and our carrots, I've just given them a good scrub rather than peeling them although you could absolutely peel them if you like. Chop these up into bite-sized pieces. We're gonna throw in a quart of tomatoes into our stew with the juice. This is a pretty rustic stew, so you can give your veggies just a rough chop don't have to be fancy. Since I don't have turnips or parsnips today, I am going to add some extra carrots and extra potatoes. Beef stew is extremely flexible as far as what you can put in it and still have it taste good. So roughly chopping our potatoes. Just try to keep the size of your potato pieces and the size of your carrots the same so that they finish cooking at approximately the same time. I'm doing my stew on the stove top, but you could bake it in the oven at 350 for around an hour or so as well. We're gonna add a quarter cup of ketchup. Some Worcestershire sauce, HP sauce, which I don't currently have. Two tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce. And we are going to add a quart of water to this. So if you follow the uh, instructions in the cookbook exactly, then you shouldn't need to add water. In my case, or not much water, around a quarter cup or so. But in my case, because I always alter the amount of, ram, amount of certain ingredients that I'm putting in depending on what I have, I am going to, in this case, because I added a whole bunch of extra potatoes and carrots to the stew, I'm going to need to grab some thyme, a little bit of salt, and a little bit of pepper, a teaspoon of salt, and a teaspoon of pepper. We're gonna add a tablespoon, no, let's see, a teaspoon of thyme, and we'll give it a stir. We're gonna let this cook down for the next hour or so, and then we'll taste it and see if it needs anything at that point, but I don't think so because it looks totally delicious. It already looks tasty. When I am using lots of sugar in certain ingredients, sometimes I cringe a little bit because it's a lot of sugar, especially in things like jellies and jams and stuff like that. But then I remember that it's a condiment and we're only eating around a tablespoon or so at a time, so it's not a big deal. So now, while that stew is cooking, and the um, cowboy candies heating up back there. I'm going to puree our pumpkin 
All right, my friends, we had a little bit of a technical difficulty with my microphone. So I'm going to share with you now what we ended up doing during that period where my microphone wasn't working. We canned up all of the jalapenos, all of the cowboy candy. So all I did with the cowboy candy was to jar it up in pint jars, wash the rims really well, because of course with all that sugar, there was a lot of sticky goop all over the edge of the jars. I gave those a good wash, lit them up, and then I canned them in my pressure canner, which I used as a steam canner for 10 minutes. And I'm gonna show you those now. I ended up with 13 jars and that is what they look like and they're going to be delicious i'm sure and i think i did show you this yesterday but this is the squash not looking quite as pretty as it did but it still looks decent and you'll notice that the liquid level has come down quite a bit i find this with squash so these didn't siphon siphoning is when the water when there's a, a drastic temperature shift like say you take the lid off too soon and you don't let it cool down a little bit the water can come up and boil over the sides and that can cause this issue. But um, in th this case, that did not happen. It's probably just that the squash themselves actually absorb a lot of the liquid. I'm sure that's why. So we got all that done. And then I did the pumpkin butter here that looks really, really, really dark. I'll show you it with some better light in a second. All I did with the pumpkin butter is I added some brown sugar, some ginger, cinnamon, a little bit of nutmeg. You can add cloves if you like cloves, but I'm not a huge fan of cloves. Mix that all up really well. And then I had it going all night long on low in my roaster oven to get this really nice thick pumpkin butter. See how nice and thick that is? So it's beautiful, but I have decided to add a little bit of maple syrup to it because it's not quite sweet enough and I also want the flavor of maple in there as well if I can get the lid off my maple syrup. So I'm going to add a little bit of maple syrup to this and then I am just going to put this into two cup portions into the freezer just in Ziploc bags because that's all I have. I am planning on ordering a few like deli style containers for the freezer because those work really well. But like I mentioned earlier, I don't freeze a lot. Um, usually the freeze dryer, the dehydrator, and the uh, and canning are kind of my preferred methods of preservation, mostly because we do produce all our own meat and our freezers are filled with meat just about year round. So let's give this a try now and see how it tastes. I feel like I did put a little bit too much ginger in here. Okay, let's give this a try. Mm, that's good. That is really, really good. So all done there. I also pureed a bunch of the squash up that I had left over and that is currently in the freeze dryer downstairs. There was a lot of moisture in that, so I expect it's going to take probably 36 hours before it's done. So I'll show you that in the next video. And you know, I had a memory that last winter I cooked up some squash and freeze dried it. <laughs> so maybe this wasn't the first time. Do you remember if I freeze dried squash before? I did. Yeah. Did I? Yeah. But we haven't used it. Yeah. yeah. So I think maybe I did do, I did do squash. I just have a memory of what it looked like when it came out of the freeze dryer. But if I did, that was last winter and we haven't used it. It's in my long-term food storage. Most of the food that I'm freeze drying, <clears throat> excuse me, that I'm freeze drying at this point is for long-term um, storage and I'm not actually using it. The only things that we're gonna be using over the winter are a lot of the fruit that I did because my kids really enjoy that on oatmeal and just even as a snack itself. I also wanted to show you how our stew turned out. It was so delicious. This recipe is fabulous. So I'll put a little bit in a bowl. Even though it is breakfast time at my house, I'm sure somebody wouldn't mind having a bowl of this amazing stew. So good. Look at how thick that is. Mm. Pardon me? You're in? <laughs> You're going to have some, some stew? Okay, so Dan's going to have... <laughs> some stew for breakfast. It is really good stew. 
If you've never made stew before, I would highly recommend giving this one a try. Like I said, I'll send it out in next week's newsletter. So if you want to sign up for my newsletter and get a copy of that, I'll put a link for that down in the show notes for you. You're going to try it? No, I'm just going to try a bite for these guys. You go right ahead. And then you have to tell me what you think. All, lots of good stuff in lots it. Lots of meat in it. Yep. Mm. A little bit more. <laughs> mm. That's really good. Oh my word. Okay. So I'll show you what I am having for breakfast this morning, which might seem like an odd breakfast, but since I started eating like this for breakfast, I am feeling way healthier. So I know this is going to seem really odd. But there's carrots, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage, just all fried up. I put a little bit of butter and salt and pepper, and that's what I eat for breakfast, and it keeps me full much longer than if I eat like toast and yogurt or something like that for breakfast. And it's doing good things for my intestines, and I am going to keep eating like this for a while, I think. You're really enjoying it too, hey? Because Dan's been eating like this too. It was actually he who started this idea. Oh, was it your mom? Because she's eating like this in the morning? Ah. Uh, ah, uh, okay. So there's some science behind this, apparently. Dan's mom was telling him about it. But because this is a lot of fiber, it helps to um, impact the way that your intestines work and causes your body to regulate its blood sugar better. So I know nothing about this <laughs> at all. I'm just eating this way because it feels good to my body. All right, friends, I think that is it for today's video. I hope that you enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you next time, which will probably be on Saturday. See you then, bye.